has permission to speak from a seat other than my own. If, if the member from Clarendon would stop disturbing you, Madam Speaker, I would ask that you grant me permission to speak from a seat other than my own. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I have a confession. And my confession is that when the leader of opposition business gave me the sectoral debate dates, I actually shrugged him off and gave them back to him because I wasn't interested this time around. I wasn't. I felt that every year we come here and somehow we do the things the same way over and over without making any kind of great impact. And the reason why I felt that way is because I thought for the many years that I've been in here that the process is backward. Because really what should happen is that these sectoral debates take place first and that then the suggestions from both sides, the best interests of both sides in a very bipartisan modern vision should then influence and craft the budget going forward with suggestions for moving the country forward. So I was indifferent to getting up one more year to come back here to give a sectoral presentation. But Madam Speaker, despite my frustration, despite my indifference, I felt that it is in times like these that one has to muster your courage and get back up one more time despite your personal feelings and emotions. Why? Because I think that courage has a responsibility. It might be perceived as unreasonable, and you might have to stand on alone on your principles, but it has a responsibility for the generations coming behind us to pave new roads. So that when we are gone, the generations like some of the first term MPs will actually, and Jamaicans will actually say, you know what? They were ahead of their time. Here, here. So once again, I boldly get up in this house for another moment, perhaps my last moment in terms of a presentation, because I feel that improving the lives of Jam Jamaicans and contributing to Jamaica is more important than my indignation to resignation of saying nothing. Here, here. Right. All right. Madam Speaker, especially no. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, the truth is the world's geopolitical tectonic plates have shifted. And they've shifted in a way that is acting at a pace that is simultaneous and that is moving in ways that perplex most of us. Historically, when the world's geopolitical plates had shifted, there were for exacting precise moments. I think some in here would remember the assassination of JFK. Some would remember the assassination of MLK. But those of us, we remember the freedom of Nelson Mandela. And certainly, other instances in terms of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in those moments, it gave us cause to pause and identify in terms of how we would move forward in terms of human connectivity. I think the most recent time that we've had our world stop, as we know it, was with the COVID pandemic. And even though COVID actually caused the world to stop on its axis, the truth is that things have gone right back to the same way. Somehow it has not reshaped how we deal with one another. And as a matter of fact, that is not only globally in terms of the gaps in human behavior, but it's also happening right here in Jamaica. It's almost an alternate universe that people want to operate within. And we see it not only in our constituencies with people being frustrated, people are frustrated with how long it takes their elected leaders to give them proper road and water. But we're also frustrated in here because we realize how long it takes us to actually get representation to give our people the road and water. So, 
Madam Speaker, there are so many displacing events now that are perplexing the world, from LGBTQ+, to the war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, to global banks that we have perceived over time to be too big to fail that are crashing, to artificial intelligence about to take every service job that we can possibly imagine, to a civil war that is taking place in Haiti right beside us. What is happening is that these displacing events worldwide are not only disturbing to some people, but it has made them apathetic and dissonant. And I believe these consequences will have disastrous effects if we don't deal with them in a particular way. Here, here. So Madam Speaker, the truth is that more of the same actually gives you just that, the same result. I've said repeatedly that we'll never really have true economic growth if we keep selling to three million people. Our population is just too small. And so we must think globally in terms of transforming our country into a place where our people's purchasing power yes. can actually make them live a better quality of life. Yeah, yeah. So we must think globally, Madam Speaker, to transform our country into the export value-added lead economy that sells goods and services to the rest of the world. Jamaica has been pursuing the same economic model and path for too long without real per capita growth for our people. And yes, all the statistics are heading in the right direction. Our balance sheet looks good. Um, everything that the minister actually came to parliament and said that we're on the right track, he's actually right. If you look at those numbers, we are on the right track. The problem is that significant economic growth continues to elude the majority of our people. And it is too marginalized, Madam Speaker, which negatively impacts the purchasing power of most of our people in this country. And so even though we look at the changing skyline in Kingston with all of the rental and commercial properties that are actually going up, the truth is that the model that we're using to somehow grow small business to medium businesses to big businesses in the long term is not working. And we're not identifying where the income and salary is going to come from, from the majority of people to either buy those places or rent those spaces. That's true. And so we can't compete globally, Madam Speaker, with small businesses on the world stage. In other words, you cannot expect a small farmer to internationally compete on the world stage with supplying what he has without completely revamping the agricultural sector, both in terms of policy. If we don't restructure the entire agricultural mindset and have processing plants urgently, Madam Speaker, that meet international standards, creating the demand for small farmers to supply, it makes no sense. It's almost as if we're spitting in the wind. Yep. Our habitual thinking, Madam Speaker, has remained the same. We're holding on to old beliefs and systems that have not allowed us to make quantum True. leaps anywhere. True. We're afraid of making the paradoxical moves. We're, we're, we have faith in the familiar and we are not challenging the boundaries that we should be challenging in this era of globalization. And our responsibility, Madam Speaker, as policymakers, is to create the economic climate and mindset that will grow the Jamaican economy in a way that increases the per capita income for all our citizens. And the time to act, Madam Speaker, is now. We cannot wait. We have been waiting for too long. And the time is now to invest the value-added capital into agriculture, medical and wellness tourism. We need to do it in our casinos. And we need to have Jamaica as a creative entertainment hub for the world to see and invest in those industries we should aggressively build out. Here, here. Listen, I, I get it. Because thinking big and thinking globally can be daunting, especially if you, if you operate and have operated in a small society for most of your life. All of us, thinking big and thinking globally can be daunting for some people who have operated in a small society and community for their entire lives. We have been taught, we have been taught 
that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So we have never been risk takers in a way that we have to take risk. And so the truth is, this is where effective leadership comes in. And I'm not talking about leadership in terms of the JLP or the PMP because everybody in here is a leader. But effective leadership comes in when you can quell the anxiety of your population, show them the vision, and then you find risk and opportunity in uncertainty. And for all of us in here, that is where we need to start going. Yep. Madam Speaker, <laughs> the creative economy, and I want the, the, the member and the Minister of Culture to listen to me. The creative economy contributes about 6.1% to global GDP, averaging anywhere between 2 to 7% of GDP worldwide. In addition to that, the United Nations projects that creative industries will generate additional revenues or annual revenues close to $2 trillion and create 50 million jobs worldwide. Half of these workers are women, many of them between the ages of 15 to 29 years old. And it, the UN also estimates that these are some of the biggest industries that will com contribute to the potential for your exports. Over the years, both PNP administrations and JLP administrations have viewed culture as a mere season of ad hoc activities to make people just feel that good. That is true. And the truth is, we don't see it as a major industry that requires stimuli that could significantly grow our economy and better the lives of our people. And Madam Speaker, both sides have reluctantly acted with conviction and financial devotion towards strengthening and developing our people's creative skills and, and really deepening our culture in this country. In the last financial year, culture as a line item in the recurrent budget received only 5.2% of the total budget. Oh boy. And that is compared to tourism, which received 13.5%. Mm. The majority of culture's budget was on transportation and people's salaries. The capital budget for culture was the lowest of all ministries, almost zero. Shame. A total of 31.8 million or 3.7 percent. This year is even worse. Shame. As there is no real recurrent increases for programs, nor any, Madam Speaker, blue pages. There's no capital expenditure for culture at all. Shame. Shame. What happens to a country that does not give additional income to build programs for their culture? It is the only ministry that does not have any blue pages. Shame, shame. The world is massive with close to 8 billion people and even though Jamaica has a population of 0.038%, we contribute greatly, almost a thousand percent, in terms of our global impact in that the world. True. And so we must allocate more resources to build out the framework to transform the cultural teaching of our young people. Here, here. Here, here. And we must do it in our school system with a sustained capital budget, Madam Speaker. <laughs> no, but it's a serious thing. Because really what we ought to be doing, Jamaica ought to have two major globally competitive performing arts high schools in this country. We ought to have one in, in the corporate area and we ought to have one in the West. And these two schools here, here. must be able to rival international best practices here, here. with boarding facilities. Here, here. We must do it from primary school all the way up. Every child that comes out of a school in Jamaica must be able to either play an instrument, act, do photography, something digital, digital, dance, Cuba does it, visual arts. We must start them young, but the only way we can do it is to have a program similar to the way that we do sports in this country. And we don't have it. The JCDCD is, JCDC is underfunded. And it is not right. Our last significant investments in culture, Madam Speaker, was in 1912 and 1958 when the Ward Theatre was built and the Little Theatre was built. That's it. You cannot be a cultural powerhouse and not have structures True. that 
identify our humanity and identify who we are as people in this country. And we don't have our Jamaicanness solidified throughout our culture and cultural fabric in our schools. And so, Madam Speaker, we have many proud achievements in culture, but we can't measure them because we do it by accident. A child who goes into school, they might have learned to play them, them, them um, drum or guitar when they go to church. church. And we need to teach them how to read notes, how to play the piano, how to do all of those things because it should not be when an MP has an additional CDF allowance that they're doing something like what the member of Northwest Manchester is doing to build a studio. Those things should be readily available in our country so that when visitors come here, they're here. They are aware. I mean, 40 years ago, after, later, after Bob Marley actually did what he has done for us globally, some people don't even know he has been, he was from Jamaica. And we really haven't done anything to, to build any other kind of musical talent in a systematic way. Or people just have talent that way. We can't even debate the motion that I tabled in here last year to make him a national hero. And that says a lot. It has fallen off the order paper. Shame, so Madam Speaker, shame, shame. the time is now to press the reset and to become courageous and move away from doing the temporary assignments in culture shame. of what's popular to doing what's right. Because if we fail to do it, our cultural footprint will wash away with the tide of other people. And we cannot have very that. Sad. It's very, very sad. Very sad. <laughs> Madam Speaker, A couple of weeks ago, I was doing some research on luxury. And the reason why I was doing the research is because I recognized that in 2022, in China, the age group of under 40s, 60% of their purchasing power was to buy luxury items. Subsequent to that, LVMH, a gentleman by the name of Bernard Arnault, who owns Louis Vuitton and Tiffany and Dior and Fendi, his, his company is now worth $500 billion. Why? Because people around the world are buying more luxury items. It brands. is, and brands, and it baffles me because with inflation, rising interest rates, um, people talking about a looming recession, that people are actually using their money and spending it on luxury goods, but they are. And by next year, it is, it is estimated that it will even increase to 70%. So 70% of people under 40 in China will purchase, 70% of their purchasing power will go to luxury items. And so luxury is not going away. As a matter of fact, people are now prepared to pay more for first class tickets. So Plane companies, airplane companies, are looking to see how they can build out their cabins to more first-class cabins because luxury is booming around the world. So the question is, if, if, if luxury is booming, why isn't Jamaica getting into luxury? Yes. Why, Daryl? Why we're not getting into luxury? And so we... <laughs> You're not luxury. So we have all of these niches that are available that we're not taking advantage of. And one of the things in terms of, of speaking to some of our, our young designers or some of our young manufacturers, Madam Speaker, because the thing about luxury is that it's rare, it's exclusive, and Jamaica has very rare and exclusive products. So you have to scale them in terms of big items. You can have them boutique-like. And there was a young woman that I spoke to who told me, she has a stationary company here, she said, you know, when she, when she went and competed in New York, her products actually made it, five of her products actually made it out of 800 stationaries in New York. It was an inter international thing. But she said by the time she got the orders and she had to put everything together, they told her she was uncompetitive because the costs to import the raw materials here, by the time they are to produce them, to export them, they cannot compete globally. Okay. And so 
She's not the only person. Her name is Sherry Ann Topping from Topping Designs. But when I went to the JMEA Expo, for example, I met young soap designers and manufacturers, candle makers. I bought beautiful handbags from, from, from a beautiful designer out of Trelawney, for example, with leather. And, and these are the items that the world wants. The problem is the import structure that we have to import the raw materials are prohibitive. And so when you look at even our Blue Mountain Coffee, yep. which is rated as one of the most luxurious brands because of how we have to reap it, why, isn't it, why aren't we doing things with it? In other words, if it's so expensive, why haven't we gone to LVMH, for example, and say, look, if you buy a Louis Vuitton bag, you get Blue Mountain Coffee. Yeah. and we partner with them or we do the value added we do it another way and we say we will produce the value added or give give the framework for manufacturers of blue mountain coffee to produce i'm sitting in a new york taxi for example from midtown going down to hudson yards which is about 20 minutes and all i'm seeing is ads of mexican avocados i see it on a repeat about six times why am I not seeing Jamaica on Blue Mountain Coffee? Why? Why am I not seeing it in Vogue? Why am I not seeing it on the, on the, in the fashion magazines? Why aren't we promoting it in another way? Nestle Nespresso, their most expensive capsule, is a Blue Mountain capsule for their coffee machine. And somehow we're not making the connections that we actually have things that are luxurious that the world wants. Yes. And so apart from saying, look, and it's the same thing with our medical tourism and our wellness tourism. <laughs> it's the same thing with our medical tourism and our wellness tourism. We haven't changed our tourism model in decades. And right now there is an investment banking conference going on in Berlin where the international, all of the heads, I'm surprised that our minister is not there, but all of them are there. And I spoke with one of the persons there today and they said to me, look, you know what luxury is going to be in tourism in another couple of years? It's going to be pristine beaches. It's going to be where you can get an exclusive experience, where the beaches are untouched. That's right. St. Mary beaches. Right. What a Pudgy. Pudgy Beach. All of those places. And so we have not married even our culture to tourism. We have been pursuing the same model for too long. Right now, as I said in here one, once before, Madam Speaker, the global wellness industry generated 4.4 trillion US dollars in 2020. At the same time, tourism wellness did 463 billion dollars. Right now, today, health, wellness, fitness, cosmetics are global businesses. We're not taking advantage of it. Moreover, moreover, no, listen to me. Moreover, a, 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 a button for you, you know. Okay. The, <laughs> the global. No, man, I'm a friend. <laughs> the global medical tourism market, Madam Speaker, counted for 104 billion in 2019 and is projected to get to 273 billion. No more than ever, we must develop our medical tourism industry. We cannot keep pursuing the same sun, sun, sea, and reggae music. We are ideally suited to become a leader in this industry. People have to fly too far to Brazil, India, and other places for medical tourism when we can do it right here. And so there needs to be an intense focus to succeed in this industry. And with the rapid advances in medical technology, and I want the Prime Minister to listen to what I'm about to say. With the rapid advances in medical technology and diagnostic equipment, which becomes obsolete very fast, imposing customs duties on medical equipment is counterproductive for our overall healthcare sector. The government would get more from the income tax charged on doctors versus the one time off duty charge that you're charging on some of this importation of first generation advanced technological equipment needed to create the facilities. Furthermore, Prime Minister, because I see that you're now listening. No brainer. I'm always listening. 
no brainer. This would naturally develop into a public-private partnership. It would. Because then, if you, if you help the private doctors, you could go into a partnership with them to say they could take some of the pressure off the public health system. And so I want you to look at it. Because in, in develop, you've done it for BPO. You do it for tourism. Why aren't we taking the risk to now develop other industries? That time is now more than ever to yes. pivot. Yes. You have to start making a paradoxical move. You have to stop, stop having faith in the familiar, and you have to challenge some boundaries. And so if, if you go into this industry, and even in the cultural one, and start driving the country in that way, in another two to three years, you will actually see the benefits and the spin-off effects, not only for the health sector, but our people would be immeasurable. Here, here, here. So here, here. we need to carve out a piece of that luxury market, which is booming. And the time to take advantage of it, Madam Speaker, is now with our Jamaican products and services. I still make a public service announcement every time I come in here because agriculture is dear to my heart and I will continue to speak about it. And there are over 200,000 farmers in this country and if we improve their lives and their incomes, we'll improve the economy. Here, here. And so the truth is... Um, I've said before, but I'll say it again, we still have the mindset in how we address agriculture that we've had for over 100 years. Not since the first banana ship has left this country in 1901 that we have done anything really significant for agriculture. And so the fact is that despite even the refrigerated container that was invented in 1930, our agricultural base and the rationale for which we plant, reap, and supply is not sustainable. I'll just put it that way. And it cannot sustain or even drive agri-exports, which are also in decline. So moving forward, Madam Speaker, we need to be laser-focused in terms of our value-added agricultural products with export markets with a value-added potential. Yeah. Our pepper, our ginger, our cocoa, yes, our coffee, yes. our ackee, our papaw, avocados. I don't know why we're not competing globally with avocados and we have some of the best avocados in the world. Our oh, Sea Island cotton or organic beef. Some of these products give us the best global competitive advantage anywhere in the world. We have the best soil and our taste profile beats the world hands down. But Madam Speaker, we have had a protectionist mindset for a long time an import substitution model, substitution model, which really all it has done is build and, and large monopolies. The idea was that it was supposed to build local industries for export, but that hasn't happened. And so we consistently import four times more than we export. And because of it, local production is high. Yeah. The only thing that really happens in some of these monopolies and um, is the labor. And a lot of it is automation. So that's why people, a lot of Jamaicans, can't afford protein. That's why we import so much chicken back and orphals in this country. Because some who get the, the import substitution preferential agreements, it's not doing what it ought to do. And I, I won't go any more on that. But other countries, Madam Speaker, have built their per capita wealth for their people in less than 10 years, and for too long we have not been building ours. So I want to make a proposal. Um, and I know that when I say this, some persons, their backs might get up, but I'm gonna say it anyway. When Michael Manley came out with Eat What You Grow and Grow What You Eat, it was relevant to that time. It was 50 years ago. And it was a concept because of the prevailing economic global circumstances which actually forced us to look inward to plant and feed for ourselves. 50 years later with globalization, that concept is not focusing outwards. And what we really ought to be saying is support our farmers, grow efficiently, and export for wealth creation, Madam Speaker. Here, here. Here, here. Because moving forward, um, the philosophy proposes that we can plant everything, but we don't have the conditions or the terrain to plant everything for ourselves. And so people get confused 
that if we plant everything, then we don't have to import anything. It's not true. We can't plant rice efficiently. We just don't have the mechanism to plant rice. There are other things we can't plant efficiently, but I'm not going to say that because some people feel that they're planting them efficiently. <laughs> but, Madam Speaker, the fact is that that policy as well, and when we say it, it does not support small farmers. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the member's time for speaking be extended by 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, the question before the House is that the member be given an additional 15 minutes to complete her presentation. Those in favor? Those against? Aye. 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 Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I, I thank my colleagues. <laughs> Madam Speaker, thank you. Um, this particular agricultural policy that I speak about, which we need to get to, is really more suitable for a globally, technologically driven world. So maybe rather than continuously subliminally seducing our people into believing that part of it and keeping them in a realm that doesn't understand global productivity, we really ought to start incentivizing our farmers hear, adequately. Hear, hear, hear. So that the farmers and the yam farmers in South Trelawney can get the adequate fertilizer that we can actually be exporting containers of yam coming out of South Trelawney. Make sure stay. You had your chance to speak. Madam Speaker, I was saying something to you. I was saying, I was saying to you that if we stop to just think about how we need to reorient the system and provide our farmers with a systematic supply and demand approach so that they're not dumping 30% of what they produce, then farmers in your constituency would be given, in South Trelawney, would be given the adequate amounts of fertilizer, water systems, so that the yams that we're producing in the boxes could be supplying the tri-state area and we would not have, people wouldn't be scrambling to be looking for two containers of yam consistently leaving our shores, which is what is happening now. People cannot get an adequate supply of yellow yam, which they want in the United States. They're taking it from Nigeria and they're taking it from Ghana. Absolutely. It should not happen. Our shipping systems are a lot better here coming. Rather than taking eight week, 18 weeks, it's better coming from here. So logistically, we should be reorienting our agricultural system, Madam Speaker. And not only doing it for yams, but it's it's... We need to recognize that we must adapt to the world of globalization because globalization is not adapting to us. It's actually the other way around. That's right. And so even the global demand for hot sauce, we're not participating in it. We're not having our farmers designated to say, look, go into pepper farming. You know why? Because in 2020, it was a $4.3 billion industry. Wow. And by 2026, it's going to be $6 billion. Right now, there are companies beating Jamaica with some taste bad pepper sauce internationally okay. that tastes like salt and vinegar. When you can have so many other companies like Walker's Wood and Spur Tree and others that just if need for us to start setting up the value-added factories that they can plant all the pepper in the world. That's what the Dominican Republic and that's what Costa Rica does. They have redesigned their markets to plant and to produce planting and, and banana chips. Most Jamaicans don't realize that most of the planting chips that they buy in Jamaica are made in Costa Rica and made in the Dominican Republic and distributed here because big companies, because they have economies of scale. What is it that we're producing? What is Jamaica known for internationally that we export? What have we put our farmers in? We've been doing it for the last 100 years the same way. That is why, Prime Minister, 
Floyd, give me a minute here. That is why, PM, I'm so excited about this new bamboo pulp investment, the $60 billion investment that's taking place in West Milan. And I want you to understand that they need 25,000 acres of idle sugar land. What that will do for farmers, they, it, at least a thousand farmers can be planting bamboo. And it's a long-term sustainable export project that will give bamboo pulp to the rest of the world. We need more investments like that so our farmers can actually have a, an adequate supply. When I talk to a, a St. Thomas farmer, woman, grandmother in St., um, at the St. Thomas market, for example, who has her granddaughter sleeping on her lap on a Saturday morning in the hot sun. All of us have that in our constituencies at markets. And she has to come out because she has to sell one box of planting. She has to sell that one box of planting because she has to send that child, her grandchild, to school. Because everybody, the grandmother still maintains the grandchild in some multi-generational homes. But she shouldn't have to do that. She shouldn't have to leave where she's coming from far to sell one box of planting. She should be able to know that Jamaica has planting factories that if she plants her entire one acre in planting, she will have a market for it and a demand for it. And they will come and pick it up. But we need, we need to have the factories, we need to have the coal storage, we need to have the dry storage, and we need to have the supply chain from the beginning all the way to the packaging, from the inputs all the way to the manufacturing of the finished product for the export. No, Lothan and I work well together. Yeah, man. The fact is, Madam Speaker, Deputy, Madam Speaker, the truth is, we can be doing better. We can be doing a lot better. And we can be doing better because we have all of the, the ingredients for that value chain from the beginning all the way to the end. And we have the shipping. We're so, we're so geographically positioned adequately yes, to ship it. Yes, yes. But it takes vision. Takes and if, if we put our farmers in priority crops, if Rada comes back to me one more time and asks me to give incentives for Irish potato, I think I'm going to scream. Because it is not earning foreign exchange for our farmers. Yeah, I know. That's fine. But Madam Speaker, the issue of producing efficient farmers to make a good standard of living must be imperative at this point in time. We must give our farmers guaranteed prices on priority crops and we must support them for export and agriculture and value-added products with lower food prices for Jamaicans. And if we do so, we can also build a school feeding program to maximize the use of local produce, Madam Speaker. Here, here. And so the truth is, I'm, 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 I stand here, and the member from St. Thomas says I have one more year, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful because I was born in Jamaica, I was schooled in Jamaica, and I've given most of my life to Jamaica. And, and 30 years ago, Madam Speaker, 30 years ago, I had the opportunity. Born here too. 30 years ago, I had an opportunity to walk a global stage, labeled as a Jamaican, and won. And so I am always Jamaican first, and I'm grateful. So the truth is, the truth is, Madam Speaker, I am grateful. I am grateful for my family. I am grateful for my son, my husband. I am grateful for my, my friends who are I love dearly, both here and abroad. I am grateful for the fact that for nearly two decades, to the people of Southeast St. Anne, who have kept me there for nearly, nearly two decades, yes. that I've been able to serve in this house under three different prime ministers. I'm grateful. Here, here. And I, I'm, 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 I'm grateful too because I've made friends on this side of the house 
on that side of the house. And the truth is, I feel like I'm in a claiming race. And, and I'm, 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 I'm grateful, um, Madam Speaker, that despite my rebelliousness, my party leader continues to give me a pass to be who I am. So, Madam Speaker, I am, I am Jamaican first. I am Jamaican first. <laughs> I am Jamaican. No, seriously. I am Jamaican first. All the time and every time. And I'm Jamaican because, because... <laughs> I have an unabashed and feisty courage. In, I'm defiant in the face of overpowering opposition. And I will, I understand that I'm not unique in this position. All of us have it within us. And we have it within us because we're Jamaicans. We have a mobilizing spirit to action. We are assertive. And nobody can bludgeon our hopes or our aspirations into acquiescence. And we don't want them to bludgeon the hopes of our people into acquiescence either. And, and it's not as if we never got that from somewhere. We got it from somewhere. All our leaders that have come through this house have demonstrated that same kind of courage that same kind of unabashed resolve that regardless of who it is in the world, regardless of class, rank or personality, money or status, once it is wrong internationally, they will take up for the underdog. That is who we are. And that is why, it's no secret, that is why we stood up first in the world and said we weren't going to trade with an apartheid South Africa. That's why persons that led on your side fought for human rights. That's why we had the dignity in the 1970s to make sure that people, when our, our reggae musicians and others sang about concrete being coal ground, Michael Manley said, look, equal work for equal pay. People must be able to own land. All of these, this is who we are. Exactly. Right? And it is not that we are going to be counterproductive. That is why all of us have that courage. That is why it behoves me to challenge in September. <laughs> if I do that, I don't intend to do that. Okay. So, Madam Speaker, it's not about me, sir. It's not about me. It's about Jamaica. So, Madam Speaker, that is why I can't understand. That is why I cannot understand how we have treated some of our friends internationally. No, it's not only Venezuela. We, we must never abandon our friends, whether it is the United States or Venezuela. Because Venezuela and the Venezuelan people, when we needed it most, gave us a $3 billion loan at 1%. 1%. And in July of 2015, they actually allowed us to pay $1.5 billion, which not only reduced our debt to GDP ratio, but it increased our international financial standing in real aggregate terms Absolutely. because of it. And what did we do? We, ex we compulsorily acquired their shares in late 2017, early 2018. The problem is now while that court case, because Venezuela has sued Jamaica, that court case is in abeyance indefinitely. Meanwhile, Venezuela is still selling oil to other people in the Caribbean and at discounted rates when we're buying oil at different rates. And so what I'm saying is we cannot be seen to abandon our friends, whether it is the United States or whether it is Venezuela. And we also cannot be seen, Madam Speaker, to be doing the bidding of other people That's over right. the dominion of That's a sovereign right. nation. And so I ask, I ask, where has the courage in our 
diplomacy and of friendship where has yes. it gone yes because God. Jamaica has always been willing to provide visionary leadership at in the ACP in CARICOM um, and I recognize the Prime Minister, I recognize your meeting with the UN Secretary General and I, I want to take the time to applaud the conversations that are taking place. It is a, it is a, good, it is a good example for the world to see um, that we are entering further along the path of climate, <coughs> climate protection climate resilience and all of the attendant issues that go into protecting a small island developing state and this is where I want to come to Jamaica also has to lead not listen lead on the fact that we're having the fact that we're having a civil war in Haiti in one of our neighbors um, doesn't sit well with me and the fact that we need to become a principal interlocutor in working to get the United States to remove the embargo on Cuba are things that our foreign affairs policy needs to continuously work at. It, 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 we have two neighbors. We have two neighbors that are in turmoil. Madam Speaker, I only need five more minutes. And we cannot be seen as as such a courageous nation that we are to have this happening right beside us and we're not doing everything in our power to help our brothers and sisters in those two countries and so madam speaker while the world continues to change rapidly because it is and it is perhaps a scary time for a lot of people especially looking at where automation took away manufacturing jobs and then they went into services and now artificial intelligence looks like it's going to take away service jobs. We have to prepare our people. Yes, this is not yes. something that is just going to come as a nine day wonder. Artificial intelligence is here. Yep. It is going to take jobs. So we have to prepare our people's imagination, efficiency, productivity to go ahead of it and our skills and we have those industries. We can do it in culture, in terms of globalizing. We can do it in medical tourism and wellness tourism. Value-added agriculture, because an avatar cannot make food. We can. And so, Madam Speaker, the time has come to start listening again, to start acting, to start doing those big things and making those bold moves. To think big and to go global. Because, <laughs> We need to start asking ourselves who we are and what we believe in. And the time has come. We have a moment. We have a moment to rekindle our soul for global humanity. And we also have a moment to say to our people that not only must they get more connected, but they must be calm about their activism and encouraged to fight for greater things, here, here. greater than themselves, here, here. while at the same time, we must encourage them to eschew political hypocrisy about correctedness. Here, here. And we must also build the industries, we must also build the industries that can help them to increase their per capita income. Here, here. We have that moment. If we squander it, and if we turn a blind eye to it, it is going to miss us and we must seize it and I fear I fear I fear that if we don't put in place these mechanisms for Jamaica to make a quantum leap in terms of our global competitiveness the Republic that we all seek might actually be one of a banana variety uh -oh. Uh -oh. Here, here. Uh -oh. Because we will not be competing on the world stage, which we must. Because only catering to three million people is not enough to give us the prosperity that we're looking for, here, here. Prime Minister. That's right. We need to be selling.
to the rest of the world. So let us all be emboldened with the courage that I know that we all have to make those moves and to start doing things differently because more of the same will just give us more of the same. Thank you, Madam Speaker.